Okay. Welcome, and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jadro. I'm a Portfolio Analyst with Tricom Funding. As a financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member in the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider webinar series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenter today is Jen Earp. For over 15 years, Jen has been committed to talent strategies in the human resources profession. Her career started in the staffing and recruiting industry, which was the foundation for expanded growth into corporate HR. She was most recently head of HR for community financial institution for 12 years. In this role, she applied human resources strategy to earn the company an award as one of the best places to work in Ohio based on employment practices and employee engagement. She is currently the managing director for HR services at Talon Resources. She assists clients with all aspects of human resources, including HR strategic planning, HR project management, recruitment strategy, selection process plans, compensation plans, performance management plans, training, employee relations, and employment policies. She has been on the board of directors for, in, for industry and field associates for over 10 years, most recently the Human Resources Association of Central Ohio. Talon Resources is a consulting, training, and coaching company focusing on the staffing and recruiting industry. With over 18 years of staffing in the staffing industry, Talon Resources has the expertise and proven track record of success needed to help their clients grow their business. Legal considerations are present throughout the entire hiring process, from job postings to qualifying resumes, interview questions, reference checking, and selection all the way through a job offer. Hiring managers and recruiters are responsible for finding the most qualified candidate in a way that does not infringe upon the protected rights of applicants. Today, our guest speaker, Jen, will discuss the legal considerations in the hiring process, overview of the federal employment laws, discrimination, harassment, and retaliation, and how to avoid legal pitfalls in the recruitment and selection process. By the end of today's webinar session, you'll have confidence in your hiring practice and know how you can reduce the legal risk associated with the hiring process. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the, either the Q&A feature or the chat feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. With that, I will turn the floor over to Jen. Thanks, Amanda. Um, like, uh, like Amanda said, um, I'm with Talon Resources. I've actually been with Talon Resources for two years um, now. Uh, and I started my career in the staffing industry, doing temporary staffing and direct hire recruiting. Um, I was doing it in a professional division of a regional staffing um, agency before I moved into to corporate HR. I um, have my undergrad in uh, human resources as well as an MBA, and I'm also a certified uh, senior professional in human resources. So hopefully I can um, communicate and bring forth uh, my experience and expertise in HR to help you with some of the challenges that you have with uh, your staffing and recruiting company. So that's enough about me. Let's get to the training. Um, as you know, uh, this is legal considerations in hiring. Um, this training is specifically focused for the, the staffing and recruiting industry. So whether you're an owner, an executive, a manager, um, a staffing representative doing placement, or a recruiter, hopefully you can get uh, some bits of information that are going to help you with the legal aspects of, of your hiring that you do with your clients. Um, 
so let's go into what we're going to cover today again. Um, we're going to focus on the federal laws. Um, obviously, there are quite a few state laws, and many of them mirror the federal laws out there. So you're going to want to also, in addition to what we're going to cover today in the federal laws, become aware of what your state laws say. And, and normally you can do a quick Google search. Many of the states, um, offices, uh, government offices will have websites dedicated to employment laws and you can get a quick summary of those employment laws in your state as well. And we're going to talk about the differences between discrimination, harassment, and retaliation and, and uh, look at some examples and to gain a better understanding of how to avoid those potential legal pitfalls in the recruitment and selection process. Okay, so what are your legal responsibilities overall in hiring? Well, like I said, there are a variety of state and federal laws that govern what you can and cannot do during all phases of the hiring process, um, whether it's interviewing, investigating, so your background checks, um, testing, so assessments, as well as selecting new employees. So first and foremost, you want to avoid illegal discrimination. So we're going to go through those federal employment laws to give you a better understanding of what is discrimination and what, um, what that covers. Um, and one of those specific laws is uh, hiring immigrants and, and your responsibilities for hiring immigrants. Um, and I know many of you that are um, doing um, uh, blue collar placements um, and also technical placements um, may uh, have more um, uh, involvement in, in hiring immigrants as well. Um, you want to understand your notification requirements. What are you required to give employees? What posters are you supposed to have? Um, data that you're supposed to collect during the hiring process, so we'll talk about that, and also the documentation responsibilities, what you should and should not document, and what you should and should not write down. Um, you also want to respect the applicant's privacy rights. You know, we're not going to get into the details of that. There are a few laws um, that discuss privacy, but um, really think about what you need at each stage in the selection process in terms of applicant information. So for example, um, social security number. Do you necessarily need the social security number on the initial application that um, the applicant fills out? Or is that something that you could wait to gain until you get to the background check process? or even the hiring process in some cases, if um, depending on when you're doing the background checks and the hiring, you might do that all at the same time and you can gather that information then. So um, it, consider, you know, think about as you're going through that process what you really need at each stage in the process because the less information that you have at each stage, um, personal identifying information, the less that could be leaked or, um, uh, taken, you know, in identity theft cases um, for applicants, unless that applicants could have a concern about as well. So um, respect the applicant's privacy rights. And refrain from making promises you can't keep. Um, that's one of the challenges that I hear quite a bit, um, and that's more under contract law. If you are uh, making verbal promises or, uh, you know, whether it's compensation or benefits, um, uh, what types of positions that the employee uh, or applicant could be placed on, um, or it's an actual written offer letter um, if you're uh, for internal employees. Um, so we're not going to go in that uh, with detail today um, because we're talking more about really that first bullet point, um, well, first, second, and third bullet points, discrimination, and, and that includes hiring immigrants and all the notification and data data collection. So um, just keep that in mind as well, refraining from making promises um, you can't keep and, and um, some of the challenges that you would get into with um, implied contracts. Okay, so let's jump right into the uh, federal laws relevant to staffing. 
So the first and main law is Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which protects individuals against employment discrimination on the basis of race and color, as well as national origin, sex, and religion. Now, Title VII applies to employers with 15 or more employees. So that includes local, um, state and local governments, um, but it also includes employment agencies and also labor unions. So uh, in, when I say employees, that's internal employees as well as temporary employees. So an employee in this situation is anybody that you're withholding Social Security for. So if they get a paycheck, they're um, counted as an employee. Um, so 15 or more employees in terms of Title VII. And we're going to go into examples, again, of, of discrimination um, in terms of Title VII as well as the other laws as well. So. Um, we'll hold off on, on looking at the details of that until we've reviewed all of these federal laws. So the next one is age discrimination in employment. Um, and the, that act protects individuals who are 40 years of age or older from employment discrimination based on age. That's a common mistake that some employers make that um, they think it's 50 or older, and it's actually 40. Um, you know, 40 is not, um, you know, that. Today, uh, we feel that you know, 40 years um, is not uh, considered an, an older age, but um, uh, as opposed to um, you know, being eligible for um, certain other benefits and whatnot. So this does cover individuals age 40 or over. Um, the Pregnancy Discrimination uh, Act forbids discrimination based on pregnancy when it comes to any aspect of employment including uh, hiring, firing, pay, job assignments, promotions, layoff training, fringe benefits, um, such as, you know, fringe benefits in this case would include leave and health insurance or any other term or condition of employment. Um, so when we talk about pregnancy discrimination, it, it involves treating a woman, so that would be an applicant or an employee, unfavorably because of their pregnancy, childbirth or a medical condition related to pregnancy or childbirth, which leads us into the next one, which is the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, sometimes a disability can be associated with pregnancy as well. Um, and the ADA prohibits private employers as well as state and local governments, employment agencies, and labor unions from discriminating against qualified individuals with disabilities in job application procedures, hiring, firing, advancement, compensation, job training, and other terms and conditions and privileges of employment. So you'll hear that quite a bit. Most of those laws can uh, include all aspects of the employment. Then when we're talking about immigration in our um, legal responsibilities, here's the law, the Immigration Reform and Control Act. So when hiring, discharging, or recruiting, or referring for a fee, employers with four or more employees may not discriminate because of national origin or citizenship status. So in this, under this law, employers must demonstrate compliance by establishing a policy of hiring only individuals who are authorized to work in the U.S. So this is not U.S. citizen only, but authorized to work. So um, we're going to talk about that a little bit more when we go through the examples. All employees need to complete the I-9 form as new hires, and employers must permit employees to present any documentation or combination of documents acceptable by law. So those are listed on um, the I-9 form. The U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service website has pictures of all the acceptable documents, which is very nice. Um, I remember when I was uh, starting out in um, staffing in HR, uh, you had to have some separate book, and it was always outdated because things, the documents changed, or how they look changed, so now they keep those updated. Um, on the website, and you can see color pictures of what those documents um, actually look like for reference, which is very nice to be able to compare those. The Employee Polygraph Protection Act, um, 
not one that um, you hear about very often. Apparently back in the day, um, employers used to use lie detector tests. So um, this prevents employers engaged in interstate commerce from using lie detector tests either for employment screening or during the course of employment with certain exemptions. So um, under this law and, and many of the other laws, an employer must post a notice of the employee's rights under this law. And it, I, I look at that poster and think, really? Wow, do, um, do people do or would they even consider using a lie detector test? But um, apparently that was an issue, um, enough that there needed to be a law and a poster. So um, speaking of employment posters, um, here's an important point. Um, a few, again, as I mentioned, of the federal employment laws require that some posters be displayed prominently where the job applicants as well as employees will see them. So uh, there's the Equal Employment Opportunity is the Law poster, the Family and Medical Leave Act poster, the Employee Polygraph Protection Act poster. All those notices must be displayed for applicants as well as employees. And there also might be some state postings that you're required to display for applicants as well. So the, the law that requires the labor law poster will indicate for whom it must be displayed. So for example, the uh, Family Medical Leave Act um, states that the FMLA poster must be placed prominently where it can be readily seen by employees and applicants for employment. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, if, uh, if you are, um, you know, have online applicants, you might consider posting a link to those posters on your, on your website where the applicants can access those if they're applying online. You also want to have them in the rooms where applicants come in for in-person interviews. Um, so whether that's in the lobby of all your branches or if you have specific interview rooms that you know that every applicant coming for an interview is going to see that poster. Um, so that's very important. And, and yes, I know they're not the most attractive displays for your decor in your office, but they're required by the law. Um, so make sure that those um, are displayed. Um, there are several laws that protect discrimination and compensation. So the next one here is the Equal Pay Act, and it requires that men and women be given equal pay for equal work in the same establishment. So the jobs need not be identical, but they must be substantially equal. Um, and it's the job content, not the job titles, that determine whether jobs are substantially equal. So employers may not pay un unequal wages to, to men and women who perform jobs that require substantially equal work, effort, and responsibility, and that are performed under similar working conditions within the same establishment. Pay uh, differentials are permitted when they are based on either seniority, merit, quantity or quality of production, or a factor, obviously, other than sex, because basing it on sex would be discriminatory. So these are known as um, affirmative defenses, and it's the employer, employer's burden to prove that they apply. So uh, if an employer finds on their own, or if the EEOC comes in and finds that there um, is uh, a difference in pay based on sex, um, no employee's pay may be reduced. Instead, the pay of the lower paid employees must be increased. So keep that in mind when you're um, pricing out positions, uh, placements for clients that, um, that you want to not necessarily, if you're basing it on the individual, that it's based on those things such as seniority and merit, quantity and quality of production, and factors other than sex, um, that those pay rates and in turn bill rates. And as a piggyback on the Equal Pay Act, there is also the, it's called the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, which deters discriminatory, discriminat ugh, discriminatory practices in the workplace and ensures that um, when discrimination does occur, wronged employees can receive fair compensation and how and when that's determined. So there's some other laws that go along with that if there's correction that needs to occur. 
The next one is the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and, and among er, other things, the Fair Credit Reporting Act governs the use of consumer reports in all employment decisions. Um, an employer may obtain an applicant's or an employee's consumer report for employment-related purposes. It, number one, gives the applicant or employee a clear and conspicuous written dis disclosure so it's in a document consisting solely of that disclosure, notifying him or her that a consumer report may be obtained. And number two, an employer has to obtain written authorization from the applicant or employee. So under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, as soon as the, an employer intends to take adverse action, so adverse action is um, you know, not hiring them, um, so as soon as they want to take adverse action against an applicant or employee based wholly or partly, so also partly, on the information contained in a consumer report, the employer must first provide the applicant or employee with a copy of the report, along with a written description of his or her rights under the statute, and that's going to include the right to request disclosure of the nature, sources, and recipients of any credit report. And according to the Fair Credit Reporting Act, adverse action includes denial of employment or any other decision for employment purposes that adversely affects any current or prospective employee. So the law keeps referencing consumer reports. So what is a consumer report? So a consumer report is a criminal background check as well as an investigation report. So an investigation report is a reference check. So if you're using a third party to do reference checks for you, and you're not hiring, you're taking adverse action, you're not hiring somebody because of the information that you've gotten in either the background check or a third, because um, you're, if you're using a third party to do your background checks, it's a, it's a report, or you're using a third party to do your reference checks, they give you a report back on those references, it's an investigation, investigative report, and you take adverse action, then you need to um, provide all the requirements under the law that I just recited to the employee or applicant in this case. So keep that in mind. And also, as a piggyback on the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, there's the um, Fair and Accurate Credit Transactions Act that says that when you're done using a consumer report, you must securely dispose of that report and any information you gathered from it. Um, so that can uh, that would include burning. <laughs> this is under the law. So burning, pulverizing, or shredding paper documents and disposing of electronic information so it can't be read or reconstructed. Um, so keep that in mind when you're getting rid of um, any, whether it's um, paper documents or uh, virtual electronic documents, that um, those are... 100% disposed of, shredded, and or deleted, that they can never be uh, reconstructed again. The Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, GINA, prohibits employers from discriminating on the basis of the information derived from genetic tests. GINA prohibits employers from making adverse employment decisions based on a per person's genetic code, um, and they're not allowed to request or demand a genetic test. So um, an example of this, because people are like, why, why would that even come up? Um, so uh, something that might uh, happen, now this is it's kind of hiring, it's more so promotion, but say for example, um, during the uh, initial hiring process, an employee, whether it be a, a, a temporary employee or an internal employee, maybe they're filling out paperwork for benefits and they're filling out a health questionnaire. And on that questionnaire, it indicates that they have a, um, a heart condition. And, um, and maybe they're uh, being considered down the road um, a few months down the road for uh, a promotion, and um, uh, the person says, well, I know they have a heart condition. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I want to put them in a high-stress job like that. 
because they have a heart condition. You cannot use genetic information, whether it's a test that comes back or information that they fill out on a form to make um, employment decisions. So there's an example of how that would apply. The next law is the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act. And it clarifies and strengthens the Veterans Reemployment Rights Statute. Um, the law protects civilian job rights and benefits for veterans and members of reserve. USERA also protects service members' rights and benefits by clarifying the law. And the law provides notice requirements of service members to employers when um, they're called to duty, as well as specific time frames for application for reemployment and report back to work after military service. So that's quite a detailed law in, in terms of time frame. So um, we're not going to go into the details of that um, today. So you want to make sure that you're educated on that. There's also um, a notice that you've probably seen in your officers or may have been um, the responsible person to display that, that um, you have to have a poster for you, Sarah. Okay, um, so the next one. Um, so the Civil Service Commission, um, the Department of Labor, the Department of Justice, and the Equal Opportunity Commission uh, jointly adopted the Uniform Guidelines on Employee Selection Procedures. And what um, this document does is it, it establishes uniform standards for employers for the use of selection procedures, and it addresses adverse impact, validation, and record keeping requirements. The uniform guidelines are not in and of themselves le legislation or law. However, through their reference and a number of judicial decisions, they've been identified by the courts as a source of technical information and have been given deference in litigation concerning employment issues. So they're not really the law, but they are kind of, um, essentially. So the uniform guidelines pertain to any and all selection procedures which are used as a basis for an employment decision. So including all steps, hiring, promotion, demotion, referral, retention, licensing and certification, training and transfer. So a selection procedure would be any measure you use in your selection pro process including reviewing resumes and applications, interviewing and assessments and testing. So technically, under these guidelines, employers should be collecting data and analyzing it to ensure each step of the selection process prevents adverse impact. So what is adverse impact? It's, it's discrimination, essentially, based on your protected class. And how they determine adverse impact is you would use the four-fifths rule, or the 80% rule is what they call it. So you're comparing the pass rates by protected class. So whether it's you're looking at race, gender, veteran, disability status, etc. So you're comparing those pa uh, pass rates for protected groups of applicants. So if any of the comparison groups do not have a passing rate equal to or greater than 80% of the comparison group, um, so the, uh, let me repeat that. If any of the comparison groups do not have a passing rate equal to or greater than 80% of the passing rate of the highest group, then it generally is held that evidence of adverse impact exists for a particular selection step or selection procedure. All righty. So the next one is um, the EO1 report. So like uniform guidelines, the EO1 report is not a law, but it's a requirement set forth by the EEOC. So employers with 100 or more employees and federal contractors with 50 or more employees must file the report on um, the race and ethnicity of employees annually by September 30th. So the date's coming up here. 
And when, when we say um, employee, the term employee, include your temporary assignment employees and any and all employees that you withheld Social Security taxes for should be counted. So what does this have to do with um, legal hiring? Well, you must gather this information in the hiring process for both your internal and your temporary employees. And the EEOC has some sample forms on their website. So if you're a federal contractor also, then you have some additional le uh, legal requirements, which we're going to cover next and that falls under Executive Order 11246. Um, it's, all, it's amended by Section um, 503 of the Rehabilitation Act um, because that covers um, veterans and individuals with disabilities under the Veterans Era, um, uh, Vietnam Era Veterans Readjustment Assistance Act. Um, all these law names are so long. Um, so that bans discrimination and require federal contractors and subcontractors to take affirmative action to ensure that all individuals have an equal opportunity for employment with our, with um, out regard to their race, their color, religion, sex, national origin, disability, um, or status as a veteran, error, or disabled veteran. So what does that mean? Um, so that means that you must include um, the equal opportunity clause in each of your um, non-exempt government contracts. So um, normally if you have uh, a contract to do staffing with a government agency, this clause is going to be in that contract if you received it from um, a federal agency. And um, if that clause is in the contract, then you are considered a federal contractor and um, then you must develop and implement affirmative action program for each establishment. So essentially it's a self-audit of your workforce to ensure that there aren't any discriminatory practices in the selection procedures and hiring, specifically underutilization of um, women and minorities and veterans and individuals with disabilities. So what you do is you gather the demographic data on all applicants. So it's not employees that are hired. So if you're, you're a federal contractor, you have to gather this information on applicants. And then you have to analyze that data to establish goals and timetables and then make good faith efforts to eliminate any underutilization in those protected classes. So many staffing companies will bid on government contracts not realizing the responsibilities and costs associated with um, having to create an affirmative action program. So keep that in mind when you're, um, when you're doing a request for a proposal, if it's a federal um, government agency, that it's likely, um, depending on the size of the contract, that you'll have to um, do affirmative action um, plan program reporting. The last one we have on this page is the Fair Labor Standards Act. So it, um, most people know, establishes minimum wage, uh, overtime pay, record keeping, and also the youth employment standards affecting full-time and part-time workers. So um, this is important when you're establishing positions and you're classifying them as either exempt or not non-exempt from overtime, and um, you're ensuring the positions are meeting the minimum wage requirements. So if you hire and are placing individuals under 18 as well, there are requirements for youth employment under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So something to keep in mind. So we had a, a question come up about um, uh, hiring decisions. And it says, how are we guided with regard to keeping a safe workplace and hiring uh, it says a DV survivor or someone accused of DV. Um, so if Yvonne, could you define um, DV survivor for me? Um, and and um, so uh, domestic violence, okay. Domestic violence survivor or someone accused of domestic, domestic violence. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, there are laws right now now, a domestic violence um, survivor, um, you know, your, your safe workplace requirements 
in terms of, of, of a survivor out there is obviously just to continue to maintain um, a, a safe workplace uh, for any individuals entering your workplace. So whether it's to have security standards or ensure that um, that your client has security standards and any um, notification process if um, somebody was coming on site um, that was not authorized um, on the work site. So um, obviously you're not going to specifically tell the client um, that this is a domestic violence survivor unless there was um, uh, a concern coming straight from the employee that they would want to share with um, the client that they would need additional protections. Now, as far as someone accused of, of domestic violence, you know, that, it's, that's up in the air right now. Um, how we're uh, able as employers to use criminal background checks. Uh, there was a recent case here, um, I'm in, in Columbus, Ohio. There was a recent case here with um, Ohio State um, University, and it talked about um, uh, an, a janitorial worker um, that was hired directly with the university that had um, violence on his criminal report in terms of um, uh, sexual uh, violence, uh, rape. Um, and it was the opinion of uh, the legal uh, attorneys involved as well as the EEOC that that individual shouldn't be restricted from being hired into their janitorial job even though they were working third shift. And uh, women were on uh, that shift with them um, in a location that would not always be um, supervised. So something to consider. You can't automatically um, dismiss applicants based on um, previous act of, uh, of violence. You really have to prove and it's getting very difficult to prove these days that someone is not qualified or eligible for a position based on their, their criminal history. Now, obvious ones might be that if they're working, maybe, maybe you're doing placements at a financial institution or somebody that's going to be um, handling confidential data and this person has fraud on their background check um, because there are some additional laws that protect um, financial institutions and privacy. So, um, so hopefully that answers uh, some of your questions, Yvonne, and you can always email me afterward um, or give me a call if you want to have more questions. Um, and we have another question from Nicole about um, English, so we're going to get into the details of that here in just a minute. Um, when we uh, talk about some of the examples for um, uh, national origin and citizenship. So let's talk about what's included under discrimination. And, and again, I repeated these over and over again when I was um, talking about the, the laws. So the law protects employees from discrimination, harassment, or retaliation. So they prohibit employers, including employment agencies and unions, from discriminating employment based on race, color, religion, sex, includes gender, national origin, disability, age, or genetic information. Um, and there was a recent for federal contractors, um, the uh, president just signed an action too that uh, prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation and there's many state laws that also protect sexual orientation, so keep that in mind. Um, the laws generally protect retaliation against persons who complain of discrimination or participate in an EEO investigation. We're going to talk a little bit more about what that is, retaliation, and in some examples. And they help to create a workplace where employees are treated with respect and dignity. And they, obviously, that's, that's, a, that's the overall purpose, really, is to create a workplace where employees um, are treated with respect and dignity. And again, I repeated these over and over and over again. Per, um, the laws prohibit discrimination in all aspects of the pre-hire in the employment relationship. So in terms of hiring, that's recruiting, interviewing, hiring, um, but also promotions, demotions, job transfers, and also compensation, training, discipline, benefit admi uh, administration, and termination or dismissal.
So discrimination is any policy or action that's taken related to, again, all those stages, recruitment, hiring, promotion, pay, or training practices that result in an unfair disadvantage to either an individual or group of individuals who are considered part of a protected class. So that, in, again, includes retaliation, employment decisions based on stereotypes or assumptions about the abilities, traits, or performance of individuals of a protected class, and then denying employment opportunities to a person because of marriage to or association with an individual in a protected class. And Title VII also prohibits discrimination because of participation in schools or places of worship associated with a, a particular protected class. So when we talk about employment action under um, discrimination, we, uh, the, the law specifically says tangible employment action, and, and that's a change in employment status or the privileges of employment. So that's, um, you know, not hired, not promoted, um, uh, not receiving a pay increase or redu receiving a reduction in pay. Um, so any of those um, protected actions um, that we just reviewed, and it's done basis, uh, based on the protected class. So you have to prove that, well, the employee in, in most cases or their attorney or the EOC is saying, okay, what ta tangible employment action occurred and was that based on their protected class status? So there's kind of a, a two-part. So discrimination overall is, you know, it's, it's illegal, it's costly, um, it's disrespectful, and, you know, it's really just bad business. Um, so what we want to take actions to prevent it, and the best thing that we can do, particularly in the interview process, is to um, have some some structure. So let's talk through some some quick tips in terms of of interviewing that will help um, eliminate discrimination from the process. So interview questions should be job related, and they should be structured. That means they're uh, valid and they're reliable, which is under those uniform guidelines that I mentioned. Um, that specifically says that each stage in the process must have must be valid and reliable. So that means job related and structured. A structured interview uses developed questions that are asked consistently of every applicant. So the question should clarify the experience of the applicant and verify the applicant's skills and knowledge to do the job. Now I understand that we're hiring individuals and we're placing them in multiple jobs, but if we can have an idea of the um, type of position, obviously, that we're going to place somebody in and have a structured interview based on the type of position rather than um, you know, a specific position, because we might not know the specific position at the time that we're interviewing the in individual. So I understand that. Um, it's recommended that the interview questions be behavioral-based. So what does that mean? Behavioral-based questions ask candidates to explain a previous experience that they've had related to a particular competency and how they handle that situation and the outcome. So for example, Tell me about a time when you received criticism about your work from a supervisor. How did you respond? You know, employees are in that situation all the time. They get feedback from their su supervisor and how they're going to react to that. So if I were to call your recent um, employers, how would you think, um, and, and they describe the attendance and punctuality. And you want to document the answers to the questions during the interview, if possible, or soon after, and, and rate those on a scale. Um, some people say, well, why, why document it? And then I have proof that I discriminate. Well, if you don't document, then you don't have proof that you didn't discriminate. Um, 
So as long as you're not writing down anything that's discriminatory based on a protected class, um, then you'll have your proof to justify um, an employment decision. So be cautious about asking follow-up questions on personal comments, and we're going to cover a few of those slides here in just a little bit. So if a candidate may say, I'll be able to make it to work at 9 o'clock which gives me plenty of time to get the kids off to school. And an interview, interviewer might illegally respond, oh, that's great, I know how it is. I have two kids. How many kids do you have? Whoa, that casual conversation has just led to a legal concern. So speaking of those legal concerns, let's start going through some of the areas that you might be concerned about um, in terms of um, name, asking for their name. Obviously, you can ask for the applicant's name. If you use the information for a background check later in the process, you may need to know if the applicant has used any other names in the past to complete reference and criminal checks. Um, you know, this is uh, acceptable, of course, but you may want to ask this information on the um, background check authorization form rather, rather than on the application, because you really don't need to know this information until you've reached that stage in the selection process. And when it comes to a woman's name, do not ask to identify Miss or Mrs. or Ms. as this information indicates the applicant's marital status. And the applicant's mar marital status has no bearing on their ability to perform the duties of the position. So um, do not ask for maiden name until you need it for a background check. In terms of residence, it's best to ask for the address for information to be mailed and the phone number at which the applicant can be reached. Um, once the individual is hired, um, you'll need the address at which the individual resides for tax purposes. So it's just, you know, the wording, um, whether it's on the application or, um, you know, other information that you're having them fill out. So a question that's a little related to this is that employers regularly have concerns about transportation to work or an assignment. Um, and you cannot ask how an applicant or employee is going to get to work or if they have a car. You can ask if the individual can work the scheduled hours for the position, and you can stress the importance of being there on time. Um, but how they get there is not uh, relevant to the job. I mean, the actual means, whether it's by a bus or they're walking or they're driving in a car, um, just that they can get to work at whatever time. Uh, age discrimination um, can run you afoul if you ask individual's birth date on the application. Now, you may need this information for a criminal background check, but again, wait. Get that information on the authorization form. Um, you also might need uh, information to verify how old they are um, for youth employment, uh, but again, um, you want to you wanna wait. Um, or you can ask, are you over the age of 18? Um, some uh, companies have that for bonding purposes. They can only bond individuals over 18. Um, or you may be asking that to determine youth employment um, restrictions. So um, you certainly can't ask, how old are you? Uh, what year did you graduate high school? Um, that comes up a bit. That's age discriminatory, and it's seen um, as uh, adverse impact. Uh, for determining an individual's age because there's an assumption that they graduated when they were 18. National origin and citizenship, they kind of go hand in hand. So those are questions asking about an applicant's nationality or citizenship, and, and they're illegal. So you cannot ask, are you a U.S. citizen? Um, you can ask, can you provide proof that you are eligible to work in the United States? Uh, do not ask what is your cultural background, what nationality is your name, where did your family come from, how long have you lived in the U.S. Um, you know, I understand that you might be looking for famili uh, familiarity or comfort with the local culture or other cultures may be important for the job. However, it's illegal to ask the question. You can ask, tell me about your work experience. Have your recent work experiences been good? Why or why not? Um, cannot ask what languages are spoken in your home, and you cannot ask are you fluent in the English, English language, and back to um, uh, Nicole's 
uh, had a question about that. Um, now, if it's a manual labor or like position um, that does not require English fluency, such as a requirement can, um, and you know, if you require English only, um, it can unlawfully screen out applicants on the basis of national origin. Um, so if you're asking that question, what languages do you read, speak, or write fluently? If um, knowing other languages are important for the position. Now you do have a responsibility um, to make accommodations for individuals if the job can be done um, not requiring English um, fluency in English. So, uh, so you're going to want to have posters safety guidelines in uh, whether that's Spanish um, or other languages, um, most likely uh, it's Spanish um, language. Uh, it's most prevalent, but it could be other languages as well, um, depending on your applicant base. So you want to um, ensure that if the position doesn't write, I mean, if they're not communicating um, with each other and you can't prove that that's a, an essential job function for the position, um, then you're going to want to provide uh, safety communication in another, in um, the other language, or at least get a translator to communicate that um, for them. I know it's tough. Um, uh, which one am I on? Oh, next page. Race. We need a boogie here because um, we're running out of time. I want to make sure that we cover um, all of these. Uh, in terms of race, it's a, it, you know this is a straightforward one. It's illegal to ask questions about an applicant's race or their skin color. So um, some of these that are adverse impact, meaning it's not direct. Um, how, do, how did you pay for your education? Do you have a good credit rating? Have your wages ever been garnished? So um, this discrimination is against lower socioeconomic groups, and it's been shown to have disparate impact on minorities. So you know it's not direct. Um, but it is, um, you know, it's indirect discrimination. In regards to uh, gender and sex, um, it's uh, illegal to ask questions stereotyping a man or a woman or making assumptions of one's abilities based on their sex. So questions you can't ask, are you, um, are you or do you plan to be married, single, engaged, divorced, are you dating anyone? <laughs> Um, what does your husband think about you working? What does your husband do? Is your husband a union member? Oh, that's a big no-no for other, um, other laws as well. How does your husband feel about you making more money than he does? Ooh, no. Um, do you have or plan to have children? How many children do you have? From our previous example, how old are they? They might just be casual conversation um, going on, but it's illegal um, in the employment or uh, in the um, interview uh, stages. So any selection stage, and can't have those casual conversations. Once they're hired, that's okay. You can have casual conversations, but not during the selection stages. Who will care for your children while you're at work? Doesn't matter. Uh, can you get a babysitter on short notice? Now, you might be asking this because you want to um, ensure that they're going to be able to get to work. You know, it's attendance and punctuality. So think about how to reword the question to legally ask. So it would be, can you work the hours required for the position? This position occasionally requires overtime. Can you work overtime as needed? If I were to talk to your last supervisor, what would he or she tell me about your attendance and punctuality? So things like that. Um, questions regarding pregnancy also falls in there. If you become pre pregnant, would you quit your job? Ooh, do not ask that. Now you might ask, what are your long-term career goals or plans for work? If they bring that up, that's fine. Now you're not going to document pregnancy, um, obviously, but they only plan on working three more years or, you know, something like that. So document within your legal confines. Um, who's your closest relative we can contact in case of an emergency? You might think, well, well that's kind of, you know, you need that information, right? Well, uh, making assumptions about the applicant's personal life as far as closest relative. Um, you want to keep it general. So ask, in case of an emergency, who should we contact? It doesn't matter if they're a relative or not. It doesn't matter. If it's a husband, don't ask for spouse. Um, uh, religion. 
creed. Um, there are just as many, if not more, variations of uh, religious affiliations as there are ethnic differences. So um, you want to avoid uh, legal uh, questions in terms of discrimination, just all questions related to religion, like what religion do you practice, what church do you attend, um, do you do any community work in connection with the church. Uh, we're going to talk about later um, organizations as well and how that um, can come into religious uh, discrimination. Military service, the law prohibits discrimination based on military status. Uh, so can't ask questions, was your military discharge honorable? Are you a member of the National Guard or Reserves? Um, you know, I, I understand that you might be asking that because an employee may be away for work for an extended period of time, and that's challenging. However, it's illegal to ask that question. Um, you might ask, do you have any upcoming events that would require extensive time away from work? In terms of education and schools attended, it's best to simply ask for a listing of the schools attended. And again, as far as high school attendance, graduation dates, um, don't ask for their graduation date from high school because, again, you can make an assumption that they graduated when they were 18, and um, then you can figure out somebody's age. So the EEOC has said, just ask if they graduated. Did you graduate from high school? Not the date that they graduated. Um, I mentioned uh, organizations. Um, asking about professional memberships would be acceptable in the application or the interview. However, you should avoid asking for a list of all clubs and organizations because you might get affiliations that identify race or religion specifically. Uh, criminal record is a big one. Um, and most of you probably know you cannot ask have you ever uh, been arrested. Um, so arrest records for minorities are st statistically higher, so um, disparate impact may occur if you're basing the selection decisions on arrests. So you can only ask if someone has been convicted of a crime, and the conviction can only be used in the selection decision, as I mentioned before, if it's job-related, and right now there's a lot of gray area in terms of job-related um, decisions in terms of arrest records. Again, you'll need um, to voluntary sol uh, voluntarily solicit race identification for um, EO1 reporting, and if you're a federal contractor um, for uh, of applicants as well, if you have to do an affirmative action plan. References, um, generally it's best to only ask for professional references. So that would be an individual that could confirm the work performance of the applicant. So general references, if you just ask for a personal reference or a general reference, that might elicit persons who might reflect race, color, religion, again, any protected class, like, or clergy. That often comes up. Um, a photograph, sometimes I get asked that question, so I threw that in here. It's, it's you know, reasonable to take a photograph after somebody is hired for identification purposes, like for a security badge or whatnot. It's not recommended to do that before. Now, obviously, if you're doing like Skype interviews or video interviewing, just like an in-person interview, you, uh, you can see that individual, but um, an employer specifically taking a picture would not be appropriate. And the last one is uh, disabilities. An employer may not discriminate based on disability under the ADA, and uh, so you don't want to ask questions, do you have a disability? Have you ever been treated for any of the following diseases? Do you have any physical impairments which would prevent you from performing a job or applying? So you want to focus on the essential functions of the job. So if an essential function of the job is lifting 50 pounds, you can ask, can you lift a box up to 50 pounds? Or can you perform the essential duties of this job without, uh, with or without reasonable accommodation? You're going to provide a job description there. Um, for sake of time, we're going to, to move to some of the examples under uh, harassment and discrimination, uh, retaliation, so we can get through those. Um, harassment is defined under the law, um, uh, under uh, case law, um, under discrimination. 
and uh, retaliation is specifically included in the law. So harassing behaviors generally um, uh, or actions generally go on over time to an, uh, somebody that is uh, you know, a current employee versus somebody that is in the hiring process. But because we're staffing organizations, um, you know, we essentially rehire. Um, you know, we've hired an employee and we're placing them on multiple jobs. So there's um, times when um, harassment um, or retaliation might occur, um, maybe not intentionally because of, uh, you know, in a, an assignment employee ends a position or a temporary employee ends a position and then we're reassigning them or not to another position. So if, um, in terms of harassment, if uh, national origin, a client requires that employees to speak only English, again, you have to evaluate the position. Is it really a job requirement that they speak only English or can they speak other languages? And if so, it's, if it's not an essential job function, you can't perform prove that it's an essential job function, then all aspects of the position have to be uh, sure that they're communicated in multiple language, most likely um, Spanish. Uh, a disability would be persistent comments are made regarding the person's disability. That would be harassing sex. A uh, client manager requests sexual favors in turn for a full-time job at the company. Uh, pregnancy, the employee's uh, assignment employee or temporary is ridicule, ridiculed for their appearance during their pregnancy. Um, age, um, the client's employees are referring to the assignment employee or temporary employee as gramps or granny. Um, it creates a hostile work environment. Uh, race, you know, any racial, racial slurs or jokes um, are uh, completely um, discriminatory. And then religion. Um, as well, if they're um, uh, for something that has come up before is wearing hijab, uh, so the the headscarf. If the client refuses an, an employee for placement because they wear a hijab, um, uh, that would be discriminatory practices. Um, and retaliation may occur if, say, for example, a temporary employee brings forth a complaint when they're on assignment. That assignment ends and then the staffing agency refuses to place the employee on future assignments. Um, maybe they're citing the individual is difficult to work with. Um, that would be a concern. So uh, there's obvious costs for violating discrimination laws. Um, pay, uh, per prospective pay, back pay, lost benefits, compensation, emotional damages, um, and uh, punitive damages as well, um, and they're sizable, 50000 to 300000 or more. Um, and there's cost to you as a recruiter. You, you know, it increases your workload. You have to work through the investigation process, the reputation of you and your organization as at risk, and there's legal costs associated with it as well. So what you want to do is, number one, respond to the employee's complaints as soon as possible and listen. Demonstrate your willingness to hear and ob objectively discuss the complaints. And when I say as soon as possible, the law says that you have to act immediately to complaints. So immediately, and, and, and it, this has been identified through case law, is within the hour. So if you're doing this within the hour or two, you have to respond. So you're going to talk to... Um, get the information from the employee and then you're going to talk to um, your executive management, your manager, executive manager, and they're, they're going to go from there for the next steps. And you're going to tell the employee that obviously you're going to try to keep this as confidential as possible, but there is an investigation has to incur. And, um, and don't object. If the employee prefers to go to an, an executive or a manager, your manager, the law says that they can do that. So let them talk to whoever they feel comfortable talking to. And obviously don't re engage in retaliation. That example that I gave, just gave of retaliation that you don't place them again because they brought forth a complaint um, is a uh, quid pro quo. I mean, I mean, that, I mean just, that just gets you uh, right away. This for that. They complained. You didn't do it. You didn't place them. So make sure that you have a designated person that's going to handle um, the investigation complaint, um, and you're going to be available for the interview as a recruiter or a staffing placement person, 
and you're going to um, be the middle person between the employee and management for those interviews and also the client as well. And you want to make sure um, as you're working with um, your management there that the, the victim isn't adversely affected um, and, and harassment stops and doesn't reoccur um, with your client. So it's constant communication with your employee um, and your clients as well. So in summary, um, we reviewed um, the federal and state laws regarding discrimination, um, harassment, retaliation. Um, hopefully you got a better understanding of how to avoid discrimination and some of those examples um, for discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. And um, make sure you know your company's policies on discrimination and understand them and follow them. And if your organization does not have policies on discrimination, harassment, and retaliation, um, that should be one of the, the top um, to-dos on your list. Uh, because when it comes to protecting yourself uh, when you have a charge come through from the EEOC or a lawsuit come through, having a policy is, um, is one of the, the factors that they consider um, for how you respond. So I want to thank you today for being on, on, on the call. Um, and I know we had a lot of information to cover in a short period of time, and there are some questions that we didn't get to today. So I would be happy to respond to those um, individuals, individual, uh, those, those people individually. <laughs> and, um, or you can email me. Uh, my contact information is um, on the screen here. So feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call. I'd be happy to talk through um, any questions um, that you have about the content of the information today. So I'm going to hand it back over to Amanda to close out the session. Wonderful. Thank you, Jen. Um, I did go ahead and put up the, the last slide here that contains both of our contact information, um, as well as opened up the poll for some feedback. Um, and, and with that, I know we've run a little bit over. I appreciate you hanging in there with us. And again, if you have any other questions um, that we were unable to get to or some other questions that you have for Jen, please feel free to reach out to her directly. She's a wonderful resource um, that um, can definitely help you with any of the questions that you may have um, in regards to the HR uh, arena. So with that, again, I'd just like to thank everybody for participating in the webinar today and Jen for sharing your vast knowledge of legal considerations and hiring. I know there's a lot to cover in that area. We will have a recording of the website or of the webinar available on our website at tricom.com. It's under the resources tab, the Industry Insider webinar series. You'll see um, a listing of several recordings. Um, this one will be included in the next few days. If you have any other questions um, or like a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation, um, please do send us an email and we'll get that out to you. Please continue watching for information on our next webinar session. We will um, have a Part A and Part B webinar on October uh, 23rd and November 20th hosted by our guest speaker from OSHA. And they're going to be presenting on general, on-site, and shared responsibilities and best practices. So keep an eye out for information on that next webinar. Again, I'd like to thank everyone, and I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day.